Hi, this is the Magnificent Midlife Podcast and I'm Rachel Lancaster. This is where we celebrate women in midlife and beyond. We challenge the status quo and bash those negative stereotypes about being an older woman. We're not over the hill at 40, 50, 60. We're just getting started. And the world needs us now more than ever. I'll be talking all things midlife, about issues that matter, and sharing fabulous stories of amazing women doing very cool stuff. Now is our time. My guest today is Liz O'Donnell, and Liz is the founder of Working Daughter, a community for women balancing elder care and career. She's the author of Working Daughter, a guide to caring for your aging parents while earning a living, which I absolutely loved. It's a brilliant book. She's a long-time marketing executive who's become a recognised expert on caregiving. And in 2020, she created National Working Daughters Day. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. It's really good to have you here. And as I was saying before I hit record, I finished your book this morning, actually, because I always try to read somebody's book and I just absolutely loved it. And I wish I'd had it last September, October, when suddenly caring really jumped into my life. And regular listeners will know that that was around the time that my mother broke her hip in October last year. So I'd been in your world. I'd known of you for quite some time, but suddenly, you know, I could have done with your book a really good <laughs> anyway. Well, you're describing the classic working daughter, right? Mm. It's usually sudden and it's so often a hip. It really is. Yeah. I don't know if people realize that hips can be life changers. Yeah. Well, I said, I've said on this podcast before that the hip, I think breaking a hip is the one thing that you hope your parent won't do. Well, um, I think there are many, but <laughs> really, well, for me, it certainly was. It was like, I think I can cope with it, but it's the hip because breaking a hip is, is massive. It's, it's yeah, really, it really massive to an older person. Trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. So why did you write this book? Basically, I went through, you know, a similar story going along as a busy working mother. I had actually just published a book about working motherhood. It's called Mogul Mom and Maid. And as I was out trying to promote the book, my parents, who lived about an hour away, just started to need more and more care. And there was this one day in particular where I had to take my mother to the doctor because both of my parents had stopped driving one because of a fall, one just thankfully he gave up the keys. And that meant I took a vacation day from work. I got up about 5.30 or 6. I sent some emails. I saw the kids go to school. I drove down to where my parents lived. You know, the schedule got pushed behind. It was just a, it was a chaotic day. The doctor was rude to me. He didn't think I should be working. He thought I should be caring for my mother full time. I mean, it was like the dark ages. I couldn't believe it. I go home. I had an event that night to speak to young mothers about my book. And it was now 11 p.m. And I'm driving home. And I remember thinking, you know what, Liz? There are a lot of people who are trying to help working mothers. But who's going to help you? Who's going to help the working daughter? And it was almost like, you know, when you watch cartoons when you're a kid and the light bulb would go off over the the character's head, it was like a light bulb moment where I realized I was in this new category. No one was talking about it. I had no plan, no peers, no, I mean, it was just, and I just thought, this is happening and I am alone trying to figure this out. And because writing is my first love and sort of how I think and work out problems, this book just started writing. I thought no one should go through this alone. And it's a lovely book because it's, you know, it's a mix of your personal experience. It's sort of part memoir. It's part sharing st stories from other working daughters, but also it's so full of advice. And I just, I loved it because it was a validation of what I had felt and what I feel. You know, my mum is a lot better now than she was. She's made a miraculous recovery, really. But she still needs a lot more care. We celebrated her 80, 89th birthday um, oh, last yes. weekend. And she needs a lot of input. And I am, it's 
four hours door to door, even though I'm in London and she's in the Midlands by the time I've got across London and onto a train and then walk from the train station to her house at the other end. It's, it's can be four hours door to door. So it's difficult, you know, and even today <laughs> I'm like grappling with, okay, so when we were up at the weekend, my mum cracked a tooth. I can share this because she never listens to my podcast. So I can share this. <laughs> but um, she cut to tooth. She's been in a lot of pain. So I rang the dentist this morning because it's just easier for me to do it. They have an appointment tomorrow morning, quarter past 10. I cannot get there in time. So I'm when we get off recording this, I'm going to go and get on a train and go up to Birmingham so I can be there to take her in the morning. So it's classic. It's classic. It's, it's classic. You, know, you I'm, are living it. <laughs> I'm living yeah. and breathing it, yeah. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that I... Well, there are many things I like about your book, but this, this idea of moving from resentment to acceptance, because I have definitely been there. I have resented it. I've... And, it wasn't until I, before reading your book, but just thought, okay, yeah, this is not just what I need to do, but it's what I want to do. And I'm it's lucky so enough to be huge. able to. But it, yeah, it's huge, isn't it? Huge, huge, yeah. The more I went through caregiving, the more, you know, the book's been out now four years, although it just came out this year in paperback. But the more I talk to working daughters, the more I think about this, the more I realize how powerful and important the mindset piece is, I mean, there are plenty of great books, websites, advice on caregiving in general. But what I think is so important, especially for the working daughter, the woman who has, you know, I don't know, maybe that woman still exists who has nothing else to do but care for her parents. But I don't know if she's existed for, you know, decades, but or even if she existed back then. But for those of us who have other, you know, plans in life, and none of us probably planned this, it's not anything we thought, you know, aspired to, thought about what happened. How we think about it, I think is so, so important. And yeah, that, that concept of acceptance. I'm the youngest of three daughters. Oftentimes it's the oldest. I'm probably the crankiest. You know, I'm not the most warm and fuzzy, compassionate. And so <clears throat> I, excuse me, I kept wondering, why is it me? I don't, I don't want, and I also was the most career focused. I had a book out, you know, I had two young kids, like, I don't want to be this person, but for whatever reason, there's always one, they say, it's a, you know, a phrase you often hear in families. There's always one who sort of steps into the role. And I think, you know, for some reason we're chosen as that one. And deep down inside, what I came to was it's who I wanted to be. I wanted to be a good daughter who showed up, you know, all in for the people that she loved. Um, I didn't necessarily want to do all the things. I didn't necessarily want to have days that started at six and ended at 11. I didn't want to spend my weekends in grocery stores with a woman on a walker when I could have been, you know, I don't know, reading a book or something. But who I wanted to be was a person who showed up in a, you know, full on loving her family. And so when you shift and think about, okay, who do I want to be? How do I want to be? It makes the what do I have to do a little more tolerable. Yeah. And, and one of the things that really jumped out, as I say, there's so many, but the fact that you're modeling caring for your, mm. uh, if you have children, you're modeling that caring for your own children. And I think that that is very powerful. I still get, when you just said that, I got chills. And I mean, I know I wrote that, but it was said to me by a hospice nurse. And there was a moment when um, I was, we were meeting with hospice to see if my mother was ready to be a candidate. And I showed up that morning in such a bad way. You know, this was early in the crisis phase of my caregiving experience and just cranky about all that was going on and how overwhelmed I was. And I really lit into this poor hospice nurse because I think, my, you know, my defenses were just down. I was exhausted because I felt like she assumed I had nothing else to do. Right. And she just, when she said to me, you know, don't worry about being home for dinner or showing up at your kids' school events right now, because what you're doing is you're modeling what unconditional love looks like. And that is so much more powerful and anything else you'll do, you know, as a parent at home. And so 
it's taken me, that was happened about 10 years ago. It's taken me about 10 years to relay that story without choking up because it was so powerful, you know, and she was so right. Um, so even when someone repeats it back to me, I get chills because, um, you know, I can only hope that that's the lesson I've taught my children, right? Is that there is not that you should do this, yes, but that there is incredible reward in showing up for the people you love. And that particular woman, she was she was very important to you, wasn't she? I dedicated the book to her. I mean, I changed her name in the book. Quite frankly, it made it easier not to have to go through approvals. But <laughs> that's the only reason she has a different name in the dedication in the book. She was very important to me. In fact, I only worked with her officially for about two weeks because my mom had to um, quickly be transferred into a hospice home. She was no, we were no longer able to have hospice at the assisted living where she was. And when that happened, the nurse changed because Bev, the nurse I'm talking about, was an at-home hospice nurse, not an in facility. But we just developed such a connection and she was just such a giving person that she um, let me, you know, keep her on speed dial and she would actually check in with me. And um, if I can just tell you, a, not related to caregiving, but related to Bev's story. So when the book came out, you know, I had lost touch with Bev, but I thought I'd be able to find her through the hospice agency. Of course, she had moved jobs. I mean, people do. And she's has no social footprint. You know, I couldn't find her anywhere. The only only time she came up in a Google search were people who had mentioned her in their family's obituaries because she clearly just made an impact in so many families' lives. So I was really disappointed because I wanted to, you know, reach out to Bev and give her a copy of the book, but I couldn't find her. So I sort of moved on. Well, one night, right before the book, I don't know, sometime around when the book came out, I got a Facebook messenger message and it was this woman and she was Bev's daughter. And so, you know, unfortunately I had used that hospice agency again for another family member. And I had mentioned, oh, do you know Bev? And told her about a book that was coming out. And so somehow word got out to Bev and Bev's daughter reached out to me and said, I don't know if this makes any sense to you, but I think you mentioned my mother in a book. I'd love to give her a copy. I was upstairs in my office. My son, who was probably, I don't know, 16 at the time, was down in our living room doing homework. And in walks his mother all of a sudden. I come running downstairs and I have tears streaming down my face. And he's like, what happened? Like, I found Bev. I found Bev. So I was able to give Bev the book. We met for coffee right before, you know, the pandemic shut everything down. And it was just such a wonderful, wonderful reunion. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. That really is lovely. I think because of what I do and because of my interest sort of in midlife and beyond and the pressures, I'm, I'm meeting more people who deal with end of life care and who deal with death on a regular basis. And they really are a breed apart, aren't they? I just find that they are just such inspiring people. Well, I think, I mean, think what you're doing, what I'm doing, what they're doing is we're, we're normalizing things that happen, but that haven't necessarily been talked about, haven't had podcasts and books and attention in this way. But, um, you know, I'm so thrilled to see so much attention on midlife. Yes. Yeah. There's a lot to talk about. Yeah, life doesn't end for a woman after her kids go to elementary school, right? Oh There's my. a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about. So why why did you focus on daughters? Why didn't you make it about anybody that's caring? The reason I focused on daughters was, um, and I gave this a lot of thought and I got a lot of criticism for it too, um, is I feel like couple things happen differently for women than for others in the caregiving experience. And one of them is the impact on our careers. You know, women often take a hit career-wise if they become parents, right? If they become a mother, they may be put on the mommy track. They may just have a gender-based, um, you know, bias in their salary and be earning less on the dollar than men. Uh, they have all the inherent biases in the workplace already. And so even though I hope that the lessons and the messages in the book are universal and we always welcome men into the working daughter community, we actually call them our working dudes so we can keep the WD acronym. <laughs> um, 
and we, we do we have a few who are quite active, which is wonderful. But I feel like there are just different pressures on women. And that's that's what I know. And that's the audience I've always written for and care about. You know, you can take a hit when you have babies and then you can take a hit when um, your parents get older. And so how do you balance those pressures? And then the other piece that's not so much career focused, but it's the societal pressure that there's an expectation that we all be very good daughters. And one of the things that was very difficult for me when I was try- looking for help from my situation, my parents and late night Googling for advice is all of the imagery and the messaging that I found about caring for my parents was what I call like rainbows and unicorns. Like, oh, what a gift to care for those who care for others. And the pictures were even like smiling mothers and daughters, just sharing, you know, staring off into space, like the future's so bright. Well, the future isn't bright. The future's hard. It's difficult. And and it made me feel really bad that I must be some kind of monster who found this less than wonderful. Um, And so I really wanted to create a place where, like you said, you knew you weren't alone and, you know, you sort of find others who understand that on one hand, we can say, this sucks. I can't take this one more day. On the other hand, we love our parents, you know, maybe not everyone who's caring for a parent loves them. And I think that's important to acknowledge too, but we can love it and hate it at the same time. And it's okay to say both. And you also talk about how it's also okay to look forward to the time when you're no longer caring, even though that means that your parents are not there anymore. Yeah. I don't just think it's okay. I think it's a really helpful exercise because I think it becomes a really helpful lens by which to view your decision making. So, for example, you know, when I was talking to Bev that day and the reason I lost my temper with her I said, I don't think you get it. You know, I've got a dad in dementia care uh, because we were talking about helping my mom who had just been diagnosed with cancer. But I said, but I also have a dad who was just diagnosed with dementia and I'm trying to help him. I have two kids and a husband at home and I feel like I'm not being with them. And I said, I don't just have a job, I have a career. And I was the sole breadwinner. My husband was a stay-at-home dad. So I cannot lose my job. And what Bev did that was so powerful was she helped me break down all those pieces. Okay, like deal with your dad at this point. This is how you'll deal with your children. And she said, but your job can't lose that. You have to, you know, have a job. The other part I would put in there that Bev and I didn't talk about that, but I think that working daughters think about is our own health. Right? We don't want to come out of caregiving so exhausted with such bad health habits that then we need care immediately. So in thinking through what is life going to look like after caregiving, we can at least set the bare minimum right, of what we need to do health-wise. And for me, it was switching from just drinking coffee and wine and eating sugar all day long to adding a, you know, water during the day. It was a time <laughs> like, but I have to do something. I, can't, I cannot exist on caffeine and alcohol through this whole experience, <laughs> need to hydrate, and like, you know, take some step. And with work, I had to show up for work. So what is the minimum, you know, it wasn't a time to go for the big promotion or, um, you know, do start a new business necessarily, but how would I make sure that I had a job after this so that I could pay for my own retirement? So I think it's also, and, you know, an important exercise. And then for someone like you, for example, if you think that through and say you have some big meeting today and you're trying to decide, do you hang up from this podcast and hop on the train for the dentist appointment or do you find an alternative? I think that thinking about life after caregiving would give you just yet another lens to think through, okay, which scenario matters the most now, which scenario will matter the most in a few years, and then you can decide dentist or important appointment. I'm actually, I realized how lucky I am to work the way I do. So I don't have an employer. I have lots of clients that I work for and I do lots of different projects. And a lot of the time I work for myself and that makes life so much easier. I can't imagine if you've got, and especially I think COVID maybe helped this because it it made working from home more possible it brought in that flexibility that carers desperately need. It made mm-hmm. it slightly better. But you talk about this, um, the fle- flexibility um, 
what's the word that you use? Like pen, I don't remember. Penalty. What I penalty. penalty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Talk. Well, tell mm-hmm. us about that. Yeah, I I wonder if it may have shifted since COVID, like you said, but my experience um, over the years from, you know, working motherhood through daughterhood was, yes, I was able to always carve out a flexible working scenario and wouldn't be employed if I couldn't have, because I had, you know, invested quite a bit in my career early on. I was all in. I had that, you know, sweat equity, if you will, that I could trade on to say, I'm working from home. I'll be working tonight, be working from the hospital, you know, whatever. I was on Zoom way before the pandemic because I was, you know, dialing into calls from all kinds of places, but it came at a cost. So I was still putting in the 40 plus hours. I was still delivering maybe not at 100%, but in the 90s, you know, on my job. Um, And for many of us who become the working daughter, we were probably overachievers anyway. So not to be obnoxious, but my, you know, my B at work was probably other people's A's, right? Um, So I was still an amazing employee. And yet my review, you know, my performance reviews stopped. And therefore my salary increases stopped because, well, Liz, you get to work a flexible schedule now. So flexibility became, took the place of compensation. And to me, that's a cost because we're still doing the work. We're still adding the value. And yet it's like, well, you want to be flexible. Don't come knocking on the, you know, the performance review door. And you also said that you didn't feel that your voice counted for as much at the decision-making table because of that flexibility, which I think is shocking, but completely understandable. Yeah. And it was really, it was really disorienting for someone who, you know, who has always been, and I I chuckle now, you know, who loved her work and like soaked up all the corporate stuff. And then you go through the caregiving experience. Like, as I say, I was, I've been present at four deaths since that time, you know, it, it, these are profound experiences and um, I still love to work, but it really puts everything in perspective and, And so I think post COVID or wherever we are since COVID, let's say that I think more people understand, you know, have a different perspective and a different appreciation for how much work and life can mingle and integrate. And so I do think that there's been a positive since the pandemic. And what's frustrating is seeing the calls back to office. I just saw an article someone posted on LinkedIn. I don't remember where it was written, but it was something about, um, women don't want to return to the office because the frail male ego only knows how to operate in that scenario. You know. Um. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Whereas we're used to operating in any scenario, as you say in the book, you did a webinar from your car yeah. outside some either care facility or hospital or something. It was at the emergency rooms and it was July <gasps> in Boston. So you lived in New York, you know how hot it can get. So I had to have the windows up because there were ambulances screaming into the parking lot and I'm melting. Yeah. And then of course, I think I mentioned this in the book and then, you know, with webinars, it's all about like, can we elevate our cameras to, you know, control the, especially <laughs> midlife like, control that chin. So I had it like, the, the laptop angled on the on the steering wheel because I'm like, my parents might be imploding, my life is imploding, but I'm going to get that camera angle that's going to flatter that chin. <laughs> Priorities. I remember something similar. It was only once, and it was it was an academic thing because the other thing I'm doing, which is just bonkers, really, I'm doing a master's in gerontology. Um, I that's thought amazing. I thought I didn't have enough to do, so that's what I'm doing. And my last assignment was on informal carers. It was, you know, oh, how I know. So I was actually writing about that, which is bonkers. But when my mum was in hospital, I was desperately trying to find somewhere quiet with a Wi-Fi connection in the hospital so that I could get onto one of my tutorials. And I didn't make it in time. I, I oh. missed half of it. I was just, you know, wandering around the hospital trying to find somewhere. And eventually I found the staff canteen and sort of stuck into there. And it was like relatively yeah. quiet. Yeah, I wrote most of my book from a hospital because, you know, I, I allude to this at the end of the book. But sadly, my husband was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. 
And he went through a year of chemo. And when I got the offer from the publisher, I had been trying to publish this book for a long time. And my agent and I kept getting rejection after rejection because people said no one would talk about the topic. No one was ever going to want to publish a book on this topic. But now look where we are, right? Thank God. Thankfully, people like you are shining lights on it and people are talking about it. So so after like a year and a half of rejections, um, my husband gets diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And I get three offers from three different publishers. The timing wow. was terrible, right? The worst <laughs> time to write a book. And I just thought, and this, I think, is an important lesson. And back to this concept of life after caregiving is Caregiving can disrupt our lives. It does disrupt our lives. But I really, really caution women to not let it stop their lives. And I often hear, and I understand the sentiment. I felt it at times myself, like my life as I knew it is over. My life as I knew it is on hold. But I really think if we can find a way to keep living through the chaos, through the caregiving, I shudder to think if at any one of those points in my life I had quit as much as, and you, I mean, you read the book, you know, I just wanted to run screaming from work. It was so hard. But if I had, where would I be now? Because my husband did pass, a, you know, a little over a year after his diagnosis, which is very common in pancreatic cancer. So now I'm, you know, talk about a sole breadwinner. I'm single mom widow. And if at any one of those stages I had quit, where would I be right now? And so I think it's so important that we find a way to as individuals to continue our own lives through caregiving. And that's why I wrote, it's an, um, oh, it's across the office. I wrote a manifesto. It's the, the Working Daughter Bill of Rights. And one of the things that it says is, and it's on my website, um, nowhere is it written that your life is less important than the life of the person you're caring for, right? It's our lives are equally valuable. And so anyway, back to the book. So it was a terrible time to say, yes, publisher, I can get this done in a year. But I also thought, give it a try. What the heck? And so I wrote a lot of that book from a chemo treatment center. And I did a lot of the phone calls from, I found a little cubicle outside of the chemo area and I would do all of my work there. And sometimes poor nurses, I get, it was like sort of tucked away. And sometimes the nurses would go to eat their lunch or have their private breaks. I think everyone like used this little, cubicle outside the chemo air is a, and a, you know, a place to hide. And on Fridays for that whole year, you'd see a nurse come around the corner and I'm there. I have my feet up. I have my laptop. I'm on a phone call. I was like, sorry, took over your office. So, sorry. I just threw a lot at you. I, I'm used to telling the story of my husband, but other people aren't. And I just blurted out. And then I realized I need to give them a minute. I apologize. You, you kept going, I think deliberately to not allow me a minute. And I just would like to say I'm I didn't know that and I'm Thank really you. sorry and that puts a whole extra layer of meaning to the book and to the it fact really that does. you're out there talking about it having experienced what you have I, I'm I'm really sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank you. I think um yeah, all brutal and difficult, and it's been a few years, and I, I apologize. I'm used to talking about it, so I, I kind no, of... No, don't, please it. don't apologize. Please don't I know apologize. I shouldn't apologize. It's not like no, I choose it. No, 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 but, no apologies, um, no whatsoever. I think maybe the universe wanted me to be focused on caregiving or something, right? I mean, it, it does give so much more meaning to the work that I'm doing. It does. Yeah. It really does. Wow. Yeah, I and I... I tried to avoid the topic, sort of end the book where the book ended for a while. But it's you know these these experiences just become so much of our of our own stories. It's hard to hard to talk around it, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. it is your story, and and death yeah. is yeah. life. Life is death, and we yeah. need to talk about these things. But it's it's also why I think the, the the pieces of the book, the living through your caregiving. And the life after caregiving have become, you know, so much more important for me since writing the book and helping women try to keep living as they're caring for someone else. Mm. I don't know where to go now. <laughs> I've got all my list of questions. That was not in the I, talking notes, and I'm thinking, <laughs> no, you, that was not in my notes. And I'm sort of, whoa. It's all right. My listeners are used to me, you know, being a little <laughs> shell shocked at times. But all my questions just seem ridiculous. 
No. But they're not because <laughs> people are going through it. And I mean, in the working, we have a private Facebook page and there's probably about 8,000 people in there. Wow. And it's just amazing. Amazing. I mean, people are going through really hard things every day. I mean, it could be the parent with dementia who screams in the middle of the night and you don't know why or wanders or the uh, siblings, you know, who just won't help. I mean, these are very real things. And sometimes, and sometimes you see that in the community, people come into the community and they'll post and they'll say, I realize what I'm going through isn't as bad as what you're going through. It doesn't matter if you're going through it, you're going through it. It's huge for you. I mean, I can't believe you're like, yeah, and she cracked her tooth and I'm getting on a train because early in the book, I would have been like, no, I will have to get on the train. Yeah, actually, yes. La, la, if this had been September last year and I've gone, bloody hell, I'm not getting on a bloody train. To, and then Please. she then she probably could have managed going by herself. And actually, she could get herself a taxi and go tomorrow. But I know she will feel so much better if I'm there. Mm -hmm. I know she will. And I can then hear what's said by the dentist. I can get her some soup, which she wouldn't be able to get, you know. And I can just do that extra sort of layer, I suppose, of just, you know. Well, so let's talk about there. that for a second, because I love everything you just said. You said she could take a taxi. And so, and the, I talk about this in the book too, about choice. And sometimes when I say to working daughters that caregiving is a choice, they get really upset with me. Because, you know, who would choose any of these things we've all, we've just described, right? And of course, no, we don't choose. <laughs> no one's like, I want to wake up today and have someone crack a tooth and cause me to get on a train and disrupt my whole day or have people I love get cancer and, you know, dementia and all of those. Things. We don't choose those things, but we do choose to show up. We don't technically have to. There are siblings and, you know, adult daughters and sons all over the place who aren't showing up. So we are choosing. And I think that's so important to think about it that way, because again, as you sort of go through this decision lens, balancing your career and your caregiving, you can think about, yes, you know, mom could take a taxi. I don't have to get on the train. I'm choosing it on the train because I'm choosing to add that extra layer. Be and, and there might be a moment where you can add that extra layer and you're like, get on the train and I hope it goes well. But two things, one, you have the ability in your schedule somehow, some way to add that sort of extra layer of care and touch and get her the soup. But also, I think you've also thought, you didn't say this out loud, but you've thought through what's going to be easier for you. Is it going to be easier for you to be there and hear the dentist, you know, right from the dentist say, here's the situation, here's the follow-up plan? Or, you know, for me, those times when I chose to let my mother go to the doctor without me, and then I'd say, okay, what did they say? Or why did they change your prescription? My mom was so cute, she'd say, oh, I don't know, don't pressure me, but he had a lovely tie. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's just worth going. Yes. <laughs> Care about his tie. Why are you going Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. If I can hear it from the doctor, yeah, it's much easier. Much, much yeah. easier. Yeah. So you talk about, you know, obviously we we need carers need better support. So how how can workplaces help their carers? Yeah. And this is another piece that I'm getting really fired up about in recent years. I recently was on a panel and I said, I am cranky because I say that a lot because I've carved out a role helping women make an impossible situation better, you know, through mindset, through hopefully some of the checklists and things in the book. But I'm conscious of the fact that I'm helping women make an almost impossible situation a little bit better. And I would much rather be make you know not that I don't want to help women but I would much rather that businesses and legislators were doing their part and listening to make the world better so I'm glad that you brought that up I think you know this concept of flexibility that we just talked about COVID proved that people can be productive at home um, and in many cases you know research shows more productive COVID also you know opened the veil to the fact that we all have messy lives and I think pre-COVID we were sort of groomed to hide those men. My, my life has been a yeah, mess, yeah, yeah. you know, managing kids and parents and 
dogs and husband. I mean, sometimes I think if the workplace knew what I'm capable of in a day, they would make me ruler of the world, right? And then I think <laughs> if the workplace knew everything I do in a day, they would never hire me again because they're like, she's way too distracted and has too much going on, right? I never know what that balance is. But COVID opened the veil to the fact that we all have busy lives because we came into each other's homes up close and personal, whether it was those pandemic puppies were barking, you know, the neighbor <laughs> was using the leaf blower. I had so many stories of people, uh, you know, we, we saw the cute memes on social media of kids, you know, photo bombing or zoom bombing. But I had so many stories in the working daughter community of people, you know, parents with dementia zoom bombing. I mean, so so the workplace knows, they fundamentally know that A, everyone has a life and B, we're capable of working remotely and juggling. So own it, accept it. And, you know, and I'm sorry that your office building is empty and I'm sorry that that's a huge expense, but stop trying to bring me in because you're paying rent. <laughs> We've got to shift. So I think flexibility is the number one most important thing. I think, of course, you know, paid leave, and I apologize, I don't know what the situation is with paid leave in the UK, but in the US, it's abysmal. You know, it, we, we don't have paid leave, of course, but leave is not the panacea. So many people think, well, we have a leave policy, but you know, your mother was hospitalized last year. She's doing better this year. She has a dental appointment tomorrow. When do you take the leave? So leave can't be the only thing that we do but it has to be part of the equation so that when we do have to take a day off, we can. And then I think the other top, top issue, and it's a little squishy, but is creating compassionate workplaces. Are we training our managers to be compassionate about the fact that people have lives? I just recently did uh, a survey of our community, and I think we had about I don't know, 700 people respond talking about what they really need at work. And the, the concept of compassion came up. People saying, you know, I know my manager knew what I was going through, but they never mentioned it. Or they knew what I was going through and they told me what a terrible job I was doing at work. And if, if someone had just sort of extended a, I see you, I'm still holding you accountable and I still expect you to tell me, you know, be, you know, we're not saying give everybody a pass. Everyone's going to miss their deadlines and it's going to be chaos, but see me in the workplace, talk about it, like acknowledge that I exist. I think that would go a really long way in making it manageable for people. Yeah, we need to change the whole culture, don't we? And I think in the UK, I think we're a bit better. Well, we're quite a lot better, actually. Um, my son lives in New York and he's just used up, I don't know, he came home for the first time in two, 18 months and uh, he used up a whole week's worth of his holiday and he's only got two. Whereas right. we, over here, we have at least four, you know, that's sort yeah. of the standard basic here. And then in America, you have, you have paid sick days, don't you? Which you can take as holiday, or what people do, or they're not supposed to really, right. but yeah. it doesn't- You do what you can. <laughs> yeah, you do what you can. But there's yeah. so little flexibility, I think, in America compared to here. We are, mm -hmm. we are better at- here at working to live. And I think in America, yeah. there is still a culture of living to living work. To work, absolutely. Um, yeah. Which doesn't help anybody. And as you, you make the point in the book, and I'm learning with my gerontology, you know, we are going to have a lot more older people in the future. We're going mm -hmm. to have a lot more pressured midlife people, especially women who are trying to juggle all the things um, and mm -hmm. look after all the people. And they're very valuable members of society and very valuable members of workplaces. So I was just saying to somebody this morning, a journalist, that we need to make work work better for women. Totally. Because when you get the insidious combination of ageism and sexism and you put it in the workplace, it's just awful. You know, ageism is bad enough for both of us, for both men and women, but for mm -hmm. women, when you add sexism in it, it's just abysmal for women. And then you add all the the extra dimension because, yes, we are expected to do the majority of the caring, whether that be for our children, our neighbours or our parents. That mm -hmm. That's the assumption is like you, you know, experience that it will be the daughter that will do it. Right. So, and, if yeah. it, and even if it isn't the daughter, it's again, it's that expectation that it's the daughter. And I might mention this in the book, but I remember going to a panel. 
there's a senior living community in my town that's like held up as one of the best. Um, I think Atul Gawande talks about it in that fabulous book, Being Mortal. I don't know if oh, you read I that. I love book. that book. book right? So um, good. <laughs> so I went to a panel on aging at this community. And so there were, you know, top thought leaders in senior living. There were CEOs of insurance companies, CEOs of healthcare companies, you know, nurse PhDs, all of these, you know, people who are thinking about this. And I counted and the panel used the word daughter seven times and they never used the word son. So there's just an expectation too, a pressure, right? That it's going to be us. Which is wrong. It's 2023 for goodness sake, you know, I mean, it, that just throws into sharp relief that there is no equality when we pretend, you know, that there is. There are still so many aspects where there is not equality. Yeah. And I think this I think this is also another reason why it's so important. And I talk more and more about this since the book came out for workplaces not to conflate workers who are parents and workers with parents, as I put it. It's really important that I think workplaces go through their policies, their procedures, their handbooks. And if they have programs in place for parents, then they should have programs in place for caregivers of other family members or neighbors yes. or whoever, like you yes. said. But not expect that the that the process is the same or that every um, benefit or support will be the same. So what I'm getting at is if you think about parenting, assuming a healthy child, right? Assuming a child who's um, developing um, along the, you know, standard schedule, whatever the heck they call it, and is healthy. That gets less hands-on and more predictable as you go along, right? You've got a little baby at home. Then you know by age four or five, depending on where you live and what the norm is, that you're going to be sending them to some kind of preschool or pre-K or whatever. You know the schedule. You know when the vacations are. You know when to schedule your well checks, right? So you can then schedule your lousy two weeks of vacation right here in the U.S., right, around that. Um, but with elder care, it's you never know when it's going to happen, and it's completely un unpredictable design you know aging and dying disease they're the bosses not us they don't there's no schedule it's never the same so the supports have to be different and also just so not just like the supports like flexibility and paid leave but understanding the psyche of the of the employee too i think is so important you know you come to you know you have a coworker they announce they're having a baby Everybody throws them a party. People beg to see the pictures. Pre-COVID, it was like, bring the baby in so we can all have cupcakes and ooh and ah, and, you know, step away from our desk for half an hour. And you come in and you might put pictures on your desk. You don't talk about your aging parents in the workplace. Nobody wants to hear it. It's tough stuff, right? It's tough stuff. Whereas a baby is often, a, you know, about possibility and joy caring for someone else is about thinking about mortality and end of life. And so you can't, you can't address them in exactly the same way, even though the, the addressing has to be equal. But we need to get better at doing that because these are all stages of life, aren't they? They're all, and, and they're normal. going to happen to everybody. The, yep. Yeah, it's the one thing we all have in common. The only thing we all have in common is dying. Yeah. I'm so much fun, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> you are but it's it's this is such such an important conversation to be having hmm. and and this is one reason I do what I do and have this podcast because I want to have these conversations I want to talk about things that other people are maybe not talking about or you know just the issues that matter to women in midlife and beyond because it, it's massive it's very it very is, important yes. and it's another stress on us as we get to midlife, you know, the sandwich generation and all of that, you know, it's, and I think the more, well, certainly my experience has been, the more we can talk about it, the more we can be open about the pressures, the easier it is. You know, me just reading your book just went, oh, yes, I recognise that. Oh, yes, I recognise that as mm -hmm. well. And, mm -hmm. you know, how you talked about the irritation and the mother-daughter tension and, you know, Again, you don't, 
that you can there can be a certain amount of shame about that, can't there? That you're supposed to have this beautiful mother daughter relationship, and mine's pretty good, but sometimes she annoys me so much, and I annoy her so much, you know. And there's all yeah, I do find that there is that mother daughter tension, <laughs> but it's okay to acknowledge that. It doesn't make me a worse daughter for acknowledging that. And I think that's what these conversations do. They, and they, it's, it's about permission. It's like your, your book is this one big permission. <laughs> it's sort of like, well, it's yes. okay. This is all right. If this happens, you're doing all right. I love that. Yeah. And one of the things we talk, I often repeat in the working daughter community is judge your actions, not your thoughts. You know, and for me, I think I talked about, just the the mere act of taking my mother grocery shopping every week was just making me miserable. And, you know, I, I really had to, again, I didn't realize I was working on mindset at the time I was going through caregiving, but I would have to go to bed at night and I could either beat myself up over the fact that the whole time we were in the grocery store earlier in the day, my inside my mind, you know, my poor little mom had had a bad fall. She's frail. Now she's now on a walker. These grocery stores, at least in the U.S., are massive. Mm. They're really overwhelming for the elderly. And it could be like hours. And in my mind, I'm screaming, hurry up, stop shuffling. <laughs> but she couldn't hear what was in my mind. <laughs> and what I was doing was I was going there every Saturday to take her grocery shopping because even though I could set up delivery, she liked to look at, you know, choices. So when I would go to bed at night, I was like, are you going to lie awake at night and think about what a rotten daughter you are because, you know, the dialogue that was in your head that I don't think anyone could hear? <laughs> or are you going to lie in bed and say, good job, Liz. You drove an hour today to take your mother shopping for two hours. Like you showed up. And I, so we really have to judge some of our actions sometimes and not our thoughts. You know? But also, as you do in the book, you have to find another solution. And eventually you have to say, OK, I'm doing the online shopping, mom. You know, and you're just going to have to put up with it. Yeah. And that's where um, the, the Working Daughter Bill of Rights stemmed from, which is, you know, nowhere is it written that her life was more important than my life. Who and how did I want to be as a daughter? I wanted to give my mom, you know, as much quality of life as I could. And I also wanted to have my own quality of life. And my mom was making choices. She could have taken a taxi, had a neighbor who offered to bring her or taken what we have here with this thing called the ride, you know, that comes and takes the elderly or the older adults, we call them now, you know, to run errands. But she said, I don't like any of those things. I only want you. So that was her choice, but it didn't mean it had to dictate my choice. Then I then get, you know, use my own agency and make a choice and say, okay, I want my mother to be fed. I want my mother to feel loved. And I am not a happy person if I'm going grocery shopping every Saturday. So three weeks out of the month, you're getting delivery. If you don't like that, exercise some of your other choices. But we're very good at being martyrs, aren't we? I think, oh, I think oh that, that we are, yeah, we're very good. And I think <clears throat> something you wrote about the book, we, the, I am the classic good girl. You know, I have been the good girl all my flipping life. I've really not done anything particularly naughty, <laughs> even in my childhood. You know, I've just been the good girl. In fact, now I'm the stroppiest I've probably ever been because I have some very strong opinions about things that, you know, on outside the mainstream and I'm going out there and I'm being stroppy about it. But it's the first time really that I've done that. And I always think, you know, that's come post-menopause because I've got, you know, I'm stroppy right. at post-menopause <laughs> and I love it. But... You know, I, I, we're very good at being martyrs. We're very good at putting everybody else first and thinking that we have to do this and we have to do that. But I love that idea of your lens of looking at your decisions and thinking, you know, is this really what needs to happen? Is this going to matter in five years time? Is this going to have such a major impact as I personally am currently thinking it will? You know, uh, right. we have to right. step out of martyr, don't we? Yeah, well, and I mean, and I don't know when you learned how to be a martyr, but I learned it from my mom. You know? Yeah, I did. I learned it from my mom. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank goodness she doesn't listen to this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah, to make sure she does not listen to this one. <laughs> this is the one she'll listen to. I probably will. Having not listened to any of the 130 before, it, she'll want to listen to this one. Yeah. Anyway. So that's what it's about. Your show is about me every week. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I feel that we could, you know, there's so many things to talk about so here. Many things we talk so about. many things. So I think maybe I'm going to have to have you back for a return visit. But as as we wind up today's session, what would you most like to leave with my audience? Two things, I think. That's so hard because I, I could talk to you about seven more hours. Ten, 15 things. Oh, I think two things. One is, you know, if if your listeners aren't there yet, you know, expect that we will be there, right? Caregiving pretty much happens to everybody in some shape or form. So there is some, you know, basic planning that we can attempt to do. Now, not all of our parents will cooperate, but if we can start to think about, you know, do I know their financial situation? Well, are they willing to give me, you know, I don't know what it's called in the UK, but power of attorney here, yes, right? Where I can you know, co-sign onto their bank accounts and know their passwords. It's just so I have a sense so that I can be in a position to help them. Do I know who they're, you know, medical? Do I know their primary care, or their specialist? Do I know what medications they're taking? Have they set me or somebody else up as a proxy? Um, and then, you know, living. What are the scenarios for future living as my parent ages? You know, um, can I have conversations with them? Not about like, hey, you know, you're not gonna be able to live in this house much longer. So what are you doing about it, lady? But, you know, <laughs> what do you see for the future, mom? I will be in this house. Okay, well, then can we talk about how we're going to make that work? Are you willing to have a home health aid in? Are you willing to add grab bars to the bathroom, you know, those types of things, or, you know, and understanding what the different options are and how they're paid for. I think if in those three areas, you just start to get organized, um, you're going to be so far ahead of so many other people. So that's one thought I would leave with everybody. And the other thought is really this idea of, you know, caregiving will happen to almost every one of us. It will disrupt our lives. It's disruptive. There's, you know, no control around it. So what are those, I guess, boundaries that you're going to set um, and choices that you're going to make? And how are you going to view caregiving so that you can continue to pursue your life? You know, it may not look the same. It may not be at all what you were expecting, but it is the card you're dealt. So how can you continue to live through caregiving so that when you are on the other side of it, because we all do get to the other side of it, then what position will be in to start, you know, going for it again. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Magnificent Midlife Podcast. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe, follow and share it. Also, giving a five-star review really helps get the word out. You'll find the show notes at magnificentmidlife.com. That's also where you can get my book, Magnificent Midlife, Transform Your Middle Years, Menopause and Beyond. Make the very best of your next chapter. Help me change the world, one magnificent midlife woman at a time.